Hello and welcome to the first episode of my new series, Were We Wrong? Where we take a look at old games and discuss whether they were as good or bad as everyone says they were. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that if you enjoy this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to follow along as I clear out my backlog. Also, feel free to let me know in the comments below what other games you'd like to see me review in this series. And now without further ado, let's get into the reason why you clicked this video. The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. A game so epic, so immersive, and so highly praised that Bethesda has released it seven times since its debut in 2011. I myself have purchased Skyrim three times, but if you've been following my videos for a while then you will know that despite playing the game for dozens if not hundreds of hours, spelunking and questing and heading up guilds, I had never actually beaten Skyrim. So as part of this series I decided that now was the time to fix my blunder, complete the main campaign and answer the question, were we wrong about Skyrim? But in order to do that I should probably clarify what we may or may not be wrong about, otherwise it's just a fancy title that doesn't mean anything. So, to clarify for those who may have been living under a rock, Skyrim was one of, if not the highest rated game of its release year, sporting a Metacritic score of 96. Critics around the world were singing its praises and awarding it full 10 out of 10s, and to this day Skyrim is held up as one of the greatest RPGs of all time. And going into this video, I must admit that I was heavily biased in favor of Skyrim. See, I grew up on RPG games, and as a kid I always wanted a game that would allow me to explore a full world discovering stories and playing a custom character that I could level and craft however I wanted. And aside from a few run-ins with games like Neverwinter Nights, I was always left slightly unsatisfied when playing RPGs. Enter Skyrim, a random game I found on a GameStop shelf during my 2011 winter break. Believe it or not, I had never heard of The Elder Scrolls before, but something about the back of the box caught my eye. So I took the game home, popped it in the PS3, and lost an hour and a half of my life, no kidding, just reading the race descriptions and making my character, a handsome Argonian spellsword named Gralder. And when I was done, I entered a fantasy world where the first notable event was a man being shot for trying to escape his execution, and the second was a dragon burning the village to the ground. Needless to say, I was hooked from the start. And back then, when I talked about Skyrim, I would always say it was everything I ever wanted in an RPG. And at the time, it really was. These days, whenever we hear the phrase, and if you see it, you can go there, we kind of just roll our eyes because we've been there, done that. But Skyrim was actually the first game I ever played where that statement was true. High Hrothgar wasn't just some tall mountain in the background as window dressing. It was a real place with a story and significance to the people of Skyrim and you could actually go there. Details like that were what once lured me onto the bandwagon of calling Skyrim the greatest RPG of all time. But since then, I've heard countless reviewers on YouTube and even some friends of mine call out Skyrim as a shallow, lazily made game that just fooled the world with its fancy graphics. And while I do agree with some of the points made by those videos, I like to come to my own conclusions. So for this review, I want to take off the rose tinted glasses and look at Skyrim as it is while also giving it a little leniency based on the industry at the time it was released. To make this easier to follow, I'm going to be breaking the review up by topic, discussing their pros and cons, and then providing my overall thoughts at the end. And since some of you weren't too keen on a 20 minute video, I've also linked each of those topics below so you can skip to what you're most interested in. To start off, I want to talk about one area I think Skyrim handles very well for the most part, and that is the world building. Since I had already played through a lot of the side content in Skyrim, when I began this playthrough I decided that I was just going to beeline through the main campaign so that I could judge the main story on its own. And that worked at first, but eventually I found myself giving in to my desire to wander off the beaten path, and I decided that that was okay. Skyrim is very clearly designed with the intention for you to get sidetracked from the main quest. There are numerous side missions that you can kind of just stumble into, and many of them actually have interesting setups. And even though I'll talk more about missions later, I think the characters and the information they provide about Skyrim as a place go a long way to make the game feel alive. I spend so much time in Skyrim just reading the books and listening to characters discuss the lore of the world. This is also one area that I think has only gotten better now that I've played other games. Specifically now that I'm more familiar with Oblivion, the lore that connects the two games is way more appealing to me. And I enjoy elements like the Dawnstar Museum quest that sort of wink at players familiar with Elder Scrolls 4 while also providing enough context to make the quest compelling for those who don't know the backstory. But even aside from Oblivion lore, I think most players will agree that the Dwemer are fascinating, and the events surrounding the Civil War are also interesting to follow up until a certain point. But there are a few missteps with the world building that can hamper immersion. And I don't mean small ones like how tons of soldiers have been getting kneecapped by an archer. I used to be an adventurer like you. And I took an arrow in the knee. 
I'm talking more about things that can take you out of the experience or that might hamper your role playing. The biggest offender for me personally is the way that being the Dragonborn interferes with character lore. Feel free to call me a nerd, but for this playthrough, I went with a Red Guard woman named Aurora Monroe. She started with a dagger, joined the Thieves Guild, and over time, I leveled her destruction magic and spec'd her into ice and lightning magic. If you haven't figured it out yet, I created her to be Storm from the X-Men, but with a few liberties. And I was really surprised how well this worked out. Actually, until I started this playthrough, I had no idea that there was a shout that could cause a full-blown lightning storm. I was extremely happy with how well I created my roleplay, and I waved off learning Fusro Da and the Whirlwind Sprints as Storm just finding creative ways to use her wind control. But then, I went to meet Parthenax, and the game forced me to do this. Yo! Now, I haven't read every issue of X-Men, but I'm pretty sure I've never seen Storm breathe fire. I was so irritated. And I know this is sort of my fault, because of course if you're in a game where they give you dragon powers, eventually you're going to breathe fire. But even if you're not a total nerd like me, there are other things that happen in Skyrim that can hamper immersion. For example, every cave not only looks basically the same, but they also all have some form of shortcut that sends you back to the entrance once you clear them. There's also the ever-present bandits and assassins that somehow haven't heard of the dragonborn who slays dragons, helped end the war, and sent Alduin packing, despite the fact that everyone seems to know what the call from High Hrothgar means. And the Closer Look channel here on YouTube also has a great video where they talk about how it makes no sense for prisons to lock up mages with no system to prevent magic use. I highly recommend it, but finish my video first. These aren't game ruining issues for me, but they are immersion breaking and caused me more than once during my playthrough to say, really? Even with these problems though, all it takes is one walk through a quiet snowstorm in the north and I'm right back sucked into my immersion. The world building in Skyrim is exceptional and is probably one of the main reasons the game is remembered so fondly. Up next we have the progression systems in Skyrim, which I consider to be more of a mixed bag. This is an area that I think has been hurt by me playing other games. When I first played Skyrim, one of my favorite features was how you could start off with a blank slate, but by repeating actions you could increase your proficiency in a given area and build your character in that direction. While this system does have its issues and can be easily exploited if you're willing to optimize the fun out of your playthrough, it largely succeeds in making your experience very flexible. But it also has one major flaw with regard to how it influences the rest of the game. And this kind of leads back to the immersion issues I mentioned. Let's say you want to build a pure mage character. So you begin the game, you get your basic fireball, and you start leveling up your destruction. Now the first issue here is that magic in Skyrim kinda sucks, and I'll talk more about that later, but follow me on this train of thought real quick. The way you unlock new spells is by finding spell books. You can find these spell books either in magic shops or lying around in dungeons, and I honestly think this is a fun mechanic that makes it interesting to explore even as a mage. On top of finding the new spell books, you also need to reach the appropriate level of mastery in order to use them, and you have to have enough magicka to cast the spell once it's unlocked. And of course you can enchant some items or craft some potions to cheese the requirements a little bit, but even then this is a time consuming and expensive process. But it's fine, it's an RPG and there's always going to be an element of grinding, plus if you're always using magic anyway, leveling the skill isn't that painful. And besides, once you finish, you'll be a master mage and nothing will be able to stand in your way. Take this locked door for example, all you have to do is whip out your unlock spell and, oh what's that, wait a minute, there is no unlock spell in this game. And if you want to know why, it's because of this menu right here. While the freedom this leveling system provides seems like it could only be a benefit, what it actually means is that the developers got to spend less time considering the way each of the three main classes would interact with the game. Because if everyone has access to the lockpick skills, why would they need to think of other ways to open locks? My first time playing through Skyrim, I didn't really notice this because I found the lockpicking to be a unique fun minigame. But over time, the more luck based nature of lockpicking really started to wear on me. I largely prefer the lockpicking mechanic in Oblivion, but that's not the only thing I prefer. In Oblivion, not only could you find spells to learn them, but as a member of the Mages Guild, you could also craft spells using knowledge you've gained. And of course, among those is an unlock spell. This matters not only for reasons of roleplay, but because if you spent most of your time grinding up mage skills for your build, backtracking to also level rogue skills like lockpicking can feel like a waste of time. And it's not just mages that benefit from this. Oblivion also has a lock bashing mechanic for those who play strength builds. Now some people might be bothered by the comparisons to Oblivion, but I'm using that game as a benchmark because it shows that the technology and the expertise to create these systems already existed at Bethesda. 
So their removal was a conscious choice, not simply the result of limitations. Now this isn't to say progression in Skyrim is terrible. In fact, I like the way you can mix and match skill trees to form your own unique builds. And over the years, channels like Fudge Muppet have proved that the Skyrim skill trees, items, and incantations allow for near limitless creativity when it comes to role playing. I just wish the system had a little bit more depth. And speaking of depth, we do need to talk a bit about the main campaign and side missions, including the guilds. This is yet another area that tends to receive mixed reactions from those who've played Skyrim. While some may enjoy the systems that feed you missions and caves to explore every few minutes, there are those who might find the loop repetitive and wish the game provided more room to breathe. This is one area where I'm not quite sure where I stand, especially when it comes to the main quest missions. While it can be nice for the game to constantly be directing you toward a goal of some sort, this can sometimes lead to missions feeling like they're held together with day old bubblegum. For example, you can choose to play a major role in the Civil War, but when it really comes down to it, none of that has any bearing on the battle with Alduin. And once it's over, the outcome doesn't really feel like it changes that much about the world. And you could argue the same thing about defeating Alduin. First off, I would like to voice my disappointment at the fact that there isn't any sort of role credit scene after Alduin is defeated. Yeah, you get a bunch of dragons flying off and praising you in Dova, but the event lacks any real weight in my opinion. I almost felt like I hadn't beaten the game. And if that weren't enough, dragons will still attack you in the world afterwards. I understand most of this is done so the game can continue encouraging you to explore. And since dragon souls are necessary to unlock shouts, you have to be able to keep fighting them but all this just lessens the weight of everything you do in the story. There are some interesting consequences your choices create. For example, the Stormcloaks and Imperials will treat you as friend or foe depending on who you side with in the war, and the Blades won't help you any further unless you kill Parthenax. But the vast majority of missions in Skyrim feel like separate events designed to funnel you into a prize as opposed to establishing your place in the world. In comparison, and I promise this is the last time I'll bring it up, Oblivion has systems that react to one another. A simple example of this is with the Thieves Guild. Sure, they're all about theft, which isn't exactly the most moral of career choices, but they're explicitly against killing. This applies not only when you're on their missions, but also when you're just out and about in the world. So if you publicly kill someone, you'll be shunned by the Thieves Guild until you've atoned for breaking the code. It's such a simple concept, but it makes the world feel connected in a way that adds to the immersion. Being a member of the Thieves Guild might make you pause and think before you join the Dark Brotherhood. While Skyrim may have a lot of things to do, it doesn't necessarily have systems that interact with each other in this way. So for this reason, Skyrim's missions and story systems are another reason why the game might be accused of being shallow. In my opinion, after considering it though, I do think the mission and story structure of Skyrim is mostly fine, just not perfect. But there is one area that I feel is actually terrible. And I don't know why it didn't bother me as a kid, but as I've gotten older, it's really started to show its cracks. And that is the combat. I hinted at this earlier when I mentioned how magic kind of sucks in Skyrim, but it isn't just magic that's unsatisfying, it's combat in general. I'm gonna break my promise and bring up Oblivion one more time, but only because I actually find it weird that Oblivion's combat somehow feels more satisfying to play. In Oblivion, there's no dual wielding magic, there's no sprint button, and the aim cursor is kind of weird at times. You would think that with the fancier graphics and new mechanics that Skyrim's combat would just be better by default since it's not that different. But somehow, sword fighting in Skyrim just kind of feels like you're slashing through paper, and magic, though it might look cool with all the particles, feels pretty ineffective most of the time. It's pretty telling that most of the combat footage in my Storm playthrough is me slashing at enemies instead of using magic. I think this issue has two major causes. First is that there isn't much feedback from enemies when you hit them. Sure, their health goes down, but normal hits on an enemy don't really have an effect on their stance or their movements, so it feels like you're both just beating each other with foam fingers until one of you dies. And the second problem is that enemy strength scales with you as you level up. I didn't bring this up earlier when I was talking about progression because I actually think it has the biggest impact on combat. For example, it leads to this weird effect where a standard Draugr can always be killed in just a few hits. So you can make your way easily through a dungeon, but then when you get to the end of the dungeon and are fighting a Dragon Priest, no matter how high your level is, they can basically one-shot you. Things like this can make combat just feel bad, but I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the three exceptions to this rule. First, two-handed weapons on heavy armor strength builds actually do feel powerful in combat. Two-handed weapons get more value from power attacks and can stun enemies, so you really feel the impact of your blows. Thing is, I'm not really a two-handed weapon guy, so I don't get to benefit from this very often. The second exception though is stealth builds, and I've had a ton of fun with this. 
There's this really funny thing that happens when you max out your stealth. And if you haven't tried this yet, I highly recommend you do it at least once. There's a perk in the stealth tree that allows you to duck mid combat and disappear from your enemy's view. This puts you back in hidden mode so you can get the damage bonus from sneak attacks with basically every blow. Pair that with a dagger for the 10x damage multiplier and you can clear any boss with ease. But you can take this a step further with the third exception and what most would consider one of the most fun combat builds in Skyrim, the Stealth Archer. There's a reason why almost every player devolves into this build at some point, and that's because of how satisfying archery is in this game. The bow and arrow UI is a huge improvement over Oblivion, and the feel of pulling back the bowstring, releasing, and hearing the hit marker, especially the stealth hit marker, and when it leads to a kill, it's just so satisfying. You know what's crazier than beating a Skyrim boss? Taking him down from across the room before he even has a chance to activate. Stealth archery is simultaneously one of the best and worst things about Skyrim combat because while in a vacuum it's fantastic, when looking at it next to something like, I don't know, destruction magic, it becomes very clear why one is fun and the other leaves so much to be desired. In my opinion, combat is the one area of Skyrim that justifies people calling it shallow. And of course there's tons more I could talk about when it comes to Skyrim. Like the fact that even after 7 releases you still need a fan made mod to stop this game from falling apart with bugs. Or that even though it eventually led to some of the least interesting open world compass designs, the way Skyrim shows you what's around without actually telling you where to go is actually pretty genius and is likely why I enjoyed the systems in Elden Ring so much. There's also the very noticeable issue that someone at Bethesda clearly has a bias for vampires over werewolves, but I think I've covered all the important topics I wanted to talk about in this video. So now it's time to answer the question posed at the beginning. Were we wrong about Skyrim? As much as it pains me to say this, I'm going to say yes. Especially when we're talking vanilla Skyrim, the game is very much overrated. I do think it's a great game, but to call it the greatest RPG ever made is quite the stretch even by the standards of the time. Back then you had games like Neverwinter Nights, Oblivion, and even Fallout New Vegas that handled role playing and character building and combat just as well if not better than Skyrim. I do think Skyrim deserves credit though for defining what we now think of as the open world genre. And I think that contribution along with the consistency of world building throughout the massive Skyrim landscape is a large reason why it was regarded so highly at the time. But as an overall package, I would say Skyrim is less the 10 out of 10 it received from critics and closer to the 8.6 out of 10 it received from its user score. It's a far cry from perfect, but it's a worthwhile experience nonetheless. Anyway, now that you've heard my take, I want to hear yours. Is Skyrim the greatest RPG of all time, or would you give that title to another game? Let me know in the comments below. Also, this video was long enough already, so I didn't really talk about the DLC and how that improved the game, but if you're interested in that, maybe I can make a follow-up video or even a stream where we can talk about it. Skyrim is one of my favorite games, so I'd be happy to discuss it more. But that's all for now though. As usual, be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.